welcome you to the session Coming of Age Novels in India Building Romance. Shaikat Majumdar is a novelist, scholar, and a popular commentator on arts, literature, and higher education. He is the author of three novels, including his most recent book, The Scent of God, The Wildly Acclaimed, The Firebird, and Silverfish. He has also published a book of literary criticism, Prose of the World. He has taught at Stanford University, was named a fellow at Humanity Center at Wellesley College, and is currently professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. We have with us Usha Kear, who is the author of the books Boys from Good Families, Monkey Man, and The Chosen. Her novels have been listed for several awards, including the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the Man Asia, the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature, a Girl and a River won the Vodafone Crossword Award 2007. Her short story, Sepia Tones, won the Kata Award for Creative Writing back in 1995. Chairing the session is Nirmala Govindrajan, who is an author, journalist, and social sector documentarian. Her new novel, Taboo, is inspired by underage girls who are kidnapped and trafficked. Nirmala has authored The Community Catalyst, recommended reading for civil service aspirants. Nirmala co curated the debut literary, uh, Times Literary Carnival and debuted the literary launch series at the British Council, Bangalore. Nirmala has pioneered the writer's yatra and reader's yatra experiences in offbeat locations. We welcome you on stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you, Times of India. Thank you, Vinita Nangya, for having us here. Um, and all my friends at the Times of India, because I've been with this organization for so many years before turning into this creative gypsy who wanders around everywhere these days. <laughs> uh, so seated in the company of two intense writers, uh, Shoykat and Usha, both of who engage with the literary format the way they would their morning kappa, I visit the pages of their recent works of fiction the scent of God and boys from good families, and recall some striking excerpts and phrases. The night of the semi-finals, Anirvan went to bed with the memory of a cricket match. He curled up with it like a child curls up with a soft toy. And so he slept, and so every night after that, it was a snatch of the day he could kiss and hug to sleep, writes Choikat in The Scent of God. He woke up with a heavy head, a ferrous tongue, and a room full of the morning light. During the night, between bouts of fitful sleep, he must have willed his exhaustion. He dreamt that his body lay limp on the bed, his limbs falling away, his manhood splayed to one side, futile, writes Usha in Boys from Good Families. What prose, right? Well, what beckons me to these works of fiction is the vivid passage of time, the drawing into the protagonist's world where night transforms into day and morning beckons dreams of the previous night. So, uh, Shaikat and Usha, um, please do talk about how you use the English language as a device to maneuver time, space, emotions, and relationships to tell your story. But shall we begin with Usha? Um. So how we use the English language, that's our first question. Well, uh, that's uh, the language that is available to me. It's uh, the language of creative expression, any sort of um, expression really at length and um, uh, if it has, uh, when it is serious. So using English to do all the things that you described, um, at a very basic uh, level, we use uh, words, you know, we select words, uh, we string sentences to convey meaning, to evoke images. And with that, you have uh, a, a whole passage. You, uh, you have something that makes sense, a tract that makes sense. You have a novel. So that, uh, it works at one level. And then you, uh, what you hope to do with your language or what you're looking to do is uh, every sentence uh, your sentences, the language has certain cadences. It has a certain meaning, a rhythm, a voice, which you try and uh, which you evoke, which works in your head. And I think as an Indian writing in English, 
uh, my language has a lot of echoes of the bhashas. You know, not just in the content, but also without realizing it in the way we write. And then I would say another use of language, or uh, we would use language not just to convey things, or not, not just to express your, yourself, but also to hide things. You know, you write so that you write between the lines. So uh, the lines that you read out, Nirmala, these are the opening lines of my novel. I'll just read it again, if, uh, it would take a minute. He woke up with a heavy head, a ferrous tongue, and a room full of the morning light. During the night, between bouts of fitful sleep, he must have willed his exhaustion. He dreamt that his body lay limp on the bed, his limbs falling away, his manhood splayed to one side, futile. So this, in a way, uh, this paragraph, uh, it foreshadows the fortunes of uh, my character, my protagonist. And it uh, plays at different levels. Uh, for one, you know that uh, for some reason he he's inarticulate. He has a ferrous tongue, and, and that's also because he's been asleep the whole night. And he also uh, he has a heavy head. He's inert. He can't do things. You know, he is uh, curiously he is uh, trapped. He can't uh, express himself or do things. And also, there's. Um, uh, there is a crisis of masculinity here, perhaps. But at the same time, he, he wakes up to a room full of the morning light. So it's possible that uh, if he can overcome or if he can, uh, you know, put up the good fight, he can, uh, he, he can come out of it. So that, I think, is uh, what language is, what I hope to do with language. Thanks, Usha. Shaikha? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that question, and thank you, Times of India, for supporting um, us in so meaningful a way. And uh, thank you for all of you for being here. I know the work week is now getting close, and you need to get back home and get back to your business. Uh, I think this is a great question, uh, really interesting, and uh, I think it has a lot to do with what I'm writing about. So my novel, The Scent of God, is a love story, uh, but love story between two boys uh, in a monastic boarding school. And uh, what I was trying to convey here is that how one of the boys wants to become a monk, but he's also in love with one of his classmates. So, and it's quite astounding how in puberty, a spiritual awakening and a sexual awakening happens at the same time, that you can't always tell the difference, what is sexual and what is spiritual. So it's, so a lot of my language here is actually driven by what I call the sensory aspect of religion. And uh, you know, I um, even with Hinduism, I think it's incredibly sensory religion. The song of hymns, you know, the smell of incense, and I have uh, situations where they're sitting in a prayer hall and they're almost meditating, but at the same time, their knees are touching each other. So it's very hard to tell the difference between what is going through their mind. So I think that coming together of the physical and the spiritual is very essential to this book and to the language. Um, and I think something Usha said really also resonates with me that I, um, you know, the shadow of the vernaculars. This is, this is, place is very important to me as a writer. And I think as I write, um, in many ways, you know, trying to capture an Indian reality, uh, it is quite fascinating when you write about Indian realities in English. And we were just talking before we came about Raja Rao's comments on Kanthapura that the challenge for the Indian English writer is to write in a language that is not one's own about a reality that is one's own. And this dissonance is, I think, what drives us. And I think this sense of vernacular, I think, Nirmala, you also dealt with it really meaningfully in, the, in your rural novels, that we are all trying to evoke a reality which is not quite belongs to the English language. And the dissonance between language and reality can become a beautiful thing. It is not a handicap. When I first started writing, I thought, oh, if I'm writing in English, I must only write about characters who meet in cocktail parties and have certain kind of drinks. And then I realized, no, I don't have to do that. You know, that there are writers, I was reading writers like the early Amitabh Ghosh or Amit Chaudhuri. And I realized that they actually they explored the gulf that exists between language and reality. 
And to give you a sense, I'll just read a very, very brief portion from the early part of the novel, which I think also tries to convey the sense of the erotic and the religious coming together. So the boy is um, this, um, run by these monks who are called swamis, and that is the atmosphere where this is happening. The song of the conch was the beginning of prayer. The boys became quiet the moment the conch was blown. Anirvan's lungs were about to burst. He felt a hand touch his right shoulder. Here, Kamal Swami said softly, give it to me. Anirvan felt his heart stop. Kamal Swami was the hostel warden of Bliss Hall, the silent monk. Nobody heard him as he never wore shoes or slippers indoors. You never knew he was, if he was far away or right behind you. The boys fell quiet the moment he walked into the room. The Swami lifted the conch to his lips. His saffron chador, neatly folded on his right shoulder, creased lightly. The music came, an arrogant, booming wail. It wouldn't stop. Not even the tribal boy Nath had such force in his lungs. The Swami paused. Turn your lips into an O, he whispered. He reached out with his fingers, touched Anirvan's lips, shaping them like he was trying to curl open the petals of a flower. He smelled of incense and cardamom, and his saffron robe was like a sea wave. Push hard while you blow. Like this, he blew again, and again, long wails swam out like fragrant war cries. They swirled around the prayer hall, flew past the long L-shaped corridor of the hostel, swung around the rooms of the boys, and floated in waves over the wide green ashram lawns. Anirvan's lips felt numb. The Swami stepped inside the prayer hall. Quietly, Anirvan followed him. Uh, that is lovely. Thanks. Yeah, so um, as you notice, the texture of the language, you know, in telling these very intense stories uh, by both these authors is so important, right? And then again, you know, a couple of days ago, I think it was on February 7th, uh, I woke up and I logged into Facebook and I suddenly found a post by the curious reader which says, uh, which had a list of uh, must read books uh, on the day, uh, it was Charles Dickens's birthday that day, and it says the list of must read books. Uh, they had listed my book called, uh, which is called Taboo, and I was like, wow, <laughs> why is this among the list? And it was among some great uh, other authors as well. Um, but what, and then when, when, when you start reading about it, um, you discover that Dickens, among others, uh, was, uh, his works were among the pioneering works of what forms the genre of Bildungsromans, okay, or coming of age novels, right? Now, Dickens is among the trendsetters of it, and uh, with his novel, Great Expectations, and then you have Volta Voltaire's Candide, then Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, um, among others, and then earlier than that, you had Homer's Odyssey as well, right? Now, uh, the building's romance, in fact, finds its origins in 19th century Germany, and a novel of this genre is regarded as one that has educational and philosophical value. In fact, the genre grew in popularity in the 20th century, and we still ride the tide of coming-of-age stories. Now, Shoykat and Usha, could you throw light on buildings romance as you know them, and also draw parallels to how the stories you tell find resonance with the genre? Shoykat, can we begin with you? Yeah, yeah sure. I think this, this genre draws me a lot. I mean, two of my novels have been coming-of-age novels. My second novel, The Firebird, which is a story of a boy's relationship with his mother, who's a theater actress. And he can't figure out, like, what does it mean to see your mother die on stage? Is it terrifying? What does it mean to see your mother kiss a stranger? What does it mean? And, you know, it's about his relationship with theater, that form, which is... And I love writing about the child from the child's perspective because there are realities which the child doesn't understand, but you get it as a child. You get it. So when you write from a child's perspective about um, something that is sexual, and you can write in a way that the child doesn't get the sexual import. It's like, reminds me of Shotujit Rai's uh, film, a Piku diary where he's watching through the windows, his mother is sleeping with her lover, and he doesn't know what's going on. So I think that's also very tempting for a writer to convey things to the child's perspective which 
the adult doesn't get. And the child's perspective is fascinating because in some ways, I mean, obviously we go back to parts of our childhood in doing that. It's, it's the part which, is, which connects with reality in a very visceral, very brutal way. We can't understand things. And when an experience moves you, but you can't make sense of it, it's very terrifying. It's very pleasurable also. It's like you know the opening scene of my last novel where he's watching his five-year-old and he thinks his mother is really dying on stage. It's actually very terrifying, but any adult would know it's a play. That, oh, she's not really dying. But this terror, this terror, which actually, to be honest, is actually comes back. I mean, my mother was an actress, and that part is a scene I remember, a kind of a cultivated scene. So I'm very fascinated by the child's, child's perspective, and that's where the coming-of-age novel really comes from. But the coming of age novels is obviously Bildung's Roman literally means the novel of education. You know, and I think Nirmala had some great examples there that how the child eventually grows up and becomes a human being, a normative human being, a citizen, a father. I mean, most European Bildung's Romans were very white and very male. That how they get a job, how their the, the education ends. It's typically in their early to mid 20s is where Bildung's Roman novels mostly end because that was the time when you know, education comes to an end. And it's, I find myself that I'm very interested in Bildung's, writing Bildung's Romans where the education is a kind of a failure, where the education doesn't. They grow in age, but they fail to become productive members of society. So in the sense of God, God, I mean, it's, um, you know, the, um, I, I find that, you know, when you hit puberty, you don't really care who's touching you. Is it a man or a woman, a boy or a girl? A certain kind of human um, warmth is all you crave. And later on, you figure out what your sexuali sexuality is. So in this novel, the decision of the protagonist to opt out of a normative sexual life and other things as well, which I don't want to give away because it has interesting relationships with monastic life. So in a way, somehow the education goes kind of wrong. Something happens. In The Firebird 2, I think, you know, again, a certain kind of attainment of sexual maturity before your age. I'm very interested in the child who is kind of toxic. For those of you who've read Nabokov's Lolita, you'll remember, you know, Lolita is that figure, that little girl who is not a little girl. There's some kind of a sexual power in her, which in a 12-year-old, it's very inappropriate. So I'm very interested in that figure. In the Firebird, that is the figure which becomes, you know, like what, I mean, people, are, people think my mother is an actress, so she's a prostitute. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean for one's pride in one's mother become toxic? When society around me thinks that women who perform are questionable, a woman who dresses up you know, and in the evening and f is fragrant and beautiful and goes out, she's going out for some other kind of job. And how the child becomes to process it, and how this relationship between the, the son and the mother actually gets very, very disturbed. And I think there are, obviously, the mother-son relationship have been explored in many classic Bildungstrom and Lawrence's Sons and Lovers being one example. But I find, I think, many interesting Bildungstrom and Paul Joyce's Portrait of an Artist and Lawrence's Sons and Lovers are a great example, where I feel writers have started to rebel against the figure becoming this productive citizen, because that's kind of boring, really. Because it's, and obviously Marxist theories say that, you know, it's productive citizen is nothing but you're serving capitalism. So there's a kind of inner rebellion that, no, I will make my protagonist become something else. I'll not make them responsible. And I find myself, and partly because I am, in my other life, I'm an academic, I'm a professor, and I write about education, I'm very interested in that subject. My novels I have returned to repeatedly in capturing the failure of education. So they grow in years, but at the end, and the, the Firebird ends when the boy is 14, and this novel ends when he's 18, they haven't quite become what society wanted them to become. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, you know, uh, extensive explanation of it. And, but could you also throw light on some of the other Bildungsroman's novels that you have been influenced by? Sure. I mean, I don't know if um, a writer is influenced consciously because I think one, as one grows up, is the whole point is to kind of get over the question of influence. You know, find one's own voice. But obviously, I think I think a lot of us like coming of age novels because that's one thing we all we were all children. Very simple. We are all children. It's like you know the whole question of can we write as 
a woman or a man or gay or straight. But the one reality we all share is we can all write as children because it's the other which we were once. The same thing, we take pleasure in reading coming-of-age novels because there's this sense we identify with the child and there's a kind of positive trajectory that one is growing up, one is aspiring. Like within the Bildungsroman genre, there's one sub-genre called the Kunstler Roman, which you know some of you um, would, would be familiar with the term. It means the Bildungsroman of an artist. So when the coming-of-age, the person who's coming-of-age is an artist or a writer, and some of my favorite coming of age novels are actually Kunstner Roman, Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, is a great example where Stephen Dedalus, who is very much an autobiographical projection of, um, you know, of, um, of James Joyce, he's figuring out you know, what it means to write, what it means to have an artistic relationship with the world. So it opens with his memories of wetting the bed. He is urinated, and then he's like, oh, it, it's warm, and then it turns cold. It's fascinating how the education proceeds from sensation to thought, because the child is only capable of sensation. The child cannot process abstract ideas. But as the child grows older, they understand language. They understand abstraction. And Joyce really captures that beautifully in that. You know, in you know, sort of Lawrence's Sons and Lovers, obviously there has been really interesting... Um, you know, the big, big struggle is with Paul Morel's relationship with his mother. You know, he's, uh, it's called, kind of called that he has an Oedipus complex. He's in love with his mother, who is married below her station. So that's also, and Paul Morel paints, which I think Lawrence uses as a kind of an alibi for writing. Paul Morel is not a writer, but he's a painter. And through that, and it's also so intensely autobiographical. So there have been a lot of these books. I think there are, I'm also speaking of Fail, Bill Dunkstrom, and one novel I really admire, one Indian novel I really admire is Indra Sinha's Animals People, which is actually set 20 years after the Bhopal gas tragedy. And those of you who know about the Bhopal gas tragedy know that you know, children were born even 20 years after with fatal, very serious birth defects. And the protagonist of this novel is this boy who's born with a birth defect that he has to walk, walk like an animal. So he's nicknamed Janwar. He's called Janwar throughout the novel. That's his name. And that's quite amazing because the very possibility of growth is stunted there. You know, he cannot grow. In fact, he can't even become human. The whole point is that he cannot come of age as a human being, but he's a Janwar and he's a slum child. So it's fascinating. It's a really... And it's narrated in his consciousness that how he processes that reality. And I, that's something I think, and if you, even if you go back and if you think of novels by Mulkrad, Anand Skouli, you know, or uh, other, other novels, and you, and you see that in India, the often growth is likely to be richly stunted. It's a nation, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of infant mo mortality, there's a lot of pain. It, the whole narrative of the growth that was imagined in 19th century Europe doesn't quite work here. A lot of our children die in infancy. A lot of our children struggle. Anand really writes about the child labor, the problem of Kuli, the pr problem of the untouchable. And that is really interesting for me. What, what are the conditions which stunt growth? And what happens when growth doesn't quite happen? What happens when a boy becomes a janwar because of some chemical tragedy that was done by some multinational 20 years back, he wasn't even around, but he's paying the price for that. So those are really fascinating questions, I feel. Thanks, Shaikat. Uh, Usha could be hear it from you now. Yeah. Oh, well, all uh, I can say is uh, oh, if you've classified it as a Bildungs Roman, I mean, uh, don't get put off by the label, uh, coming of age novel, it's uh, we are in good company. Uh, portrait of the artist as a young man, and uh, I think another one is the adventures of Oji March, Sol Bello, yes. which is very very poignant, and of course uh, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, and maybe Emma Jane Austen. So uh, I'll uh, so the the question about an education, you know, about life being a rough teacher, and your uh, what is it that you have to go by. Uh, in my novel, uh, that is Boys from Good Families, uh, the protagonist, he, uh, it is, so part of it is set in Bangalore, and uh, he has an unquestioning acceptance of the circumstances of his life. Um, he, is, uh, uh, he is born in a well-to-do family, 
and it is a traditional, uh, a conservative uh, uh, upbringing, and they are uh, very well off. And he, it, it's almost as if he just kind of floats on this river called life, and then something happens. He falls in love, or he's smitten, by the girl who lives in the outhouse, and there, the, the gates come slamming down. I mean, nothing is ever made or, or obvious, or it's not as if he's thrown out of his house, but he's made aware of the fact, he becomes aware of how small and mean his life is, and the people, his people, his parents, his entire support system, you know, they are going to support him if, so long as, but, you know, these are the conditions that are imposed on him, and he decides that he wants to have nothing to do with them. So, uh, a part of the, you know, the tradition of the Bildungsroman, you rebel and you leave. There is a journey, you travel. And so he, he decides that he is going to go where he is free. And, and also he wants to study further. He has the means, his family provides him with the means. So he goes, where else can you be free? America. America is like the sun in the sky of freedom. And he goes there to study. But of course, the, the point is freedom is not going to be handed over to you on a plate. It's not a ready-made product, you know. There be dragons there. You, you've got to be, uh, you have to see, freedom is going to question you. Are you fit for freedom? Uh, have you really lost, um, you know, overcome all the, uh, the taboos, the restrictions, your own uh, the mental inhibitions that you were brought up with? So he has some positive experiences, some negative experiences, and he comes back home after 25 years to see that his house is not the same as it was. His family is not the warm, safe, analog zone that he thought it was. It's a bone of contention. Again, uh, what the novel is looking at is how relationships, the community, cities, countries, families change. You know, what is the... Uh, uh, what, how have relationships changed? His house is now no longer a home, but it's his inheritance, and um, uh, it is real estate. So, the, and of course, there are unexpected pleasures. He meets his nephew and his niece, and there, uh, there are positive relationships, and he learns new things. They lead him into experiences that he was bereft of. So the, the point in this education or coming of age is that you know, life is difficult, but the only way you learn about it is you can't lean or depend on things that you've been taught. You've got to face things on your own, and maybe there is little that you can really fall back on. Yeah. Like your boys in the ashram who, you know, at the, uh, when they touch each other, they know that it is pleasurable. It's only later that they are going to parse it and see it or even think of what it is. So your experiences, will not necessarily enrich you. And the knowledge that you gain is, uh, you know, is not always pleasurable. It's not going to leave you as a wise man who knows all the answers. Uh, the thing that you have to do is that you just have to live life. And uh, at some stage, and, and make the most of it. Uh, that yeah. is the learning experience. Uh, that is there. Even in my earlier book, it was uh, A Girl and a River, set yeah. during the freedom movement. Here again, uh, I find myself writing about people who are born into, say, in, uh, into positions of privilege or who don't think, who don't question their circumstances. And suddenly something comes up, you know. You are called to think upon what you, your complacency is shaken. And then there is a fallout. You know, there is, uh, what happens is there is, a, 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 there is, thing. your world goes into a spin. And what do you have to deal with it? What do you have to really cope with that? Accept your own resources, what you make of the world. You fall back on your senses and you fall back on your sensibilities. That, that is what yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. Five minutes to go. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. We have time. We started late. All so right. it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. One quick point. Uh, one yeah. very important point she makes is the theme of travel. Lot of coming of age is about, it's not just a temporal route, but also a spatial one. Yeah. 
yes. you know i can't a lot of them start in rural provincial areas and they have to they are aspiring to the big city they are going somewhere so the end of you know end of um, portrait of an artist uh, steven redless leaves for paris you know paul morel goes to to london and this is a very interesting thing in the indian context it's a kind of a colonial prejudice that where you come from it doesn't matter it's a small place it's a petty place you must go somewhere else and this is a trajectory of ambition we see all around that you know people from rural karnataka coming to bangalore to kind of fulfill their ambitions so we must if you are want to act you must go to bombay or if you want to do fashion you must go to paris this whole sense that the colonial ambition is also charted along space where i think actually golan river is very interesting because it's set in the anti colonial period and i think you know gandhi's visit in the village actually puts them because that's a time when that colonial that things are trope yes. is exactly very different yeah. so that's it. that trajectory i find very very fascinating of of that time and of that setting right true so in effect the buildings roman embodies the physical psychological spiritual journey of the protagonist also struggle for identity societal conflict and and a loss of innocence right so could you throw light i mean both of you all have dealt with these aspects in your books in your books so could you throw light on how your protagonists uh, kind of go through this journey who who wants to sure I think I just spoke about, you know, how my protagonist goes uh, through it. Maybe Shaikh, if you'd like to speak. First. Yeah, I've also touched on it. I mean, as I said, at a very simple level, it's just a love story, and what happens when you, you know, feel that you are. I mean, the, it, the, I think the novel ends up questioning, uh, asking questions like, what is monastic celibacy? You know, what is monastic celibacy? And I think when. Um, I mean I was when I was writing this I didn't think something like Sabari Mala the controversy about that would come out that what happens I mean the whole idea that you if you just keep women out especially menstruating women you know male monastic celibacy that's a very cute thought but you know very very innocent thought and I think those are the struggles that my protagonist goes through that you know you are supposed to be celibate but you are in this very intimate space and um you 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 fall in love and then what are the guilts and then uh, there are things like um physical punishment so when you're physically beaten um does the physical violence carry the stamp of something else so there's a teacher says at a point that oh they beat them up because there's something else they want to do that they can't you know not always so there is this whole discipline and punish when the cane falls on the bare skin there's a kind of a fleshy noise so it's it's all about that and then i think you know the thing is that in many ways the novel poses a kind of a binary between a idyllic ashram environment and a gritty world of the streets where there are women so in a way that not the protagonist faces a decision between a gritty dusty world of heterosexuality versus an ashram world where there's a different kind of romance awaits him and what decision he takes is i guess the i guess i wouldn't say the surprise of the book or what whatever he does will decide the fate of the book so it's about you know how we make sense of our sexualities how we make sense of and obviously when i wrote this this is set in 80s and 90s and 90s bengal and saffron is a very powerful color in this book as you can see i mean this this cover uh, which got some attention was one of the the the, the cover designer told the model who's an iconic well known um uh, lgbt um photographer that you know look and cultivate the look of delayed orgasm so that was like what is a look of delayed orgasm that's the this is what delayed orgasm looks like so we th those are the delayed orgasm is kind of a motive and uh, but saffron was not political so this was not a time when saffron was political saffron is a very powerful force and saffron is faced with a declining communist world but it's not political it's kind of almost predicts it there are these moments of islamophobia like it opens with a scene when india is playing pakistan and right outside the ashram is a poor muslim village and this boys are cheering for india and thinking like every time pakistan gets a wicket oh those villages cheer because they are supporting pakistan so in a way i mean i'm and i when i wrote this and now with the i think rise of bjp in bengal it was almost like i was kind of looking at the trends that were always latent but most of all it's a very private novel and novel about young boys who are not politically conscious so i wouldn't too far yeah. usha would you like to add to it oh uh, yeah uh, maybe we can get on to the next question so, yeah, yeah. yeah. i have nothing to add there 
All right, yeah. So um, actually, there are a lot of metaphors as well in his book. You know, you have the melting mother and, <laughs> you know, quite interesting, you know, some of the, the way he puts it along with the colors is also those aspects, you know. It's, a, so it's a really, ma I mean, the monasteries, for the anybody who knows, yeah. it's actually very thinly veiled ref reference to a real yeah. <laughs> monastic order. Yeah. And <laughs> the melting yeah. mother and the, great and the great bearded, happy bearded one yeah. and, the yeah. and the great saffron one are clear references to, you know, <laughs> three prophetic figures, who, which is quite recognizable. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So um, as a woman so thus far, I have been drawn to writing stories through the eyes of women, through the eyes of, you know, uh, young girls who are exploited and, you know, trafficked women. Now, Usha writes through the eyes of a man in her latest book. And uh, uh, Shoika deals with same-sex uh, love. Now, uh, could you tell us, could you talk about your calling to write through the eyes of a main protagonist and your relationship with the protagonist? In your writing, by your writing. Yeah. Actually, in this book, uh, uh, my protagonist, Ashwat, I mean, he's a male protagonist. But, uh, I, I mean, I would say that uh, this was just a ruse, you know. It is incidental that he's male. It's a ruse to examine uh, concerns and life experiences that would, uh, uh, I mean, to put it very broadly, the human predicament, you know, things that would be common to both men and women, to everybody. Uh, questions of kinship, of community, of family, and uh, uh, rebellion, freedom, you know, what your responsibilities are, how far you would go to acknowledge it, uh, whether you deliver or you don't. These are the questions that I wanted to explore. And Ashwat happened to be male. And uh, he, at that time, he could travel, you know, he, he traveled and um, for education and for uh, other purposes, because he uh, wanted to leave his home. But there is another character, his sister, Savitri, and her predicament is a, a little more subtle, because she is the one who has to suffer on account of the fallout of what her brother does. And she herself is not aware of it. Cause and effect are not so closely linked either in the way events are described in the novel or, uh, the, or uh, the way she realizes it. So whether I think our destinies are linked, you know, as uh, siblings, as parents and children, as spouses, uh, in every way, men and women. So that is something that I wanted to, at a larger level, explore questions about, uh, you know, human existence to uh, reflect deeper on what, what it is to live a life and what it is to live by certain rules and then realize what it means and whether you want to abide by them or not. So that is what uh, I wanted to explore. Um, uh, another thing was also an, another question that came in through the stories of, I mean, the, uh, the male and the female, that is brother and sister, is how societies change, how cities change. And I was also very keen on bringing in the millennial experience, you know, whether Youngsters today, they perceive the world. What are the kind of, uh, what do they draw from the ecosystem? What, is it, what are the signals they are given? How do they react to it? And what is, how, what is the shape that rebellion takes? Uh, the way the youngster, that is the nephew, uh, my hero's nephew, the protagonist's nephew, rebels against his parents or he decides to find his own way is very different from the provocations that uh, the protagonist felt. So that is, uh, so I would say that uh, the important thing is to explore um, the human journey as uh, you make your way through the various stages of life. And there's a lot of attention to detail, a lot of detailing in your work, yes. you know, which is uh, very brilliant because it brings alive all the nuances. Yeah, and it's right. Just, uh, Actually, yeah, uh, yeah the d details are necessary to add texture to tell you more about uh, uh, your characters and the events. Actu uh, this critic, James Wood, he has this phrase that uh, he's made popular. He says, literature, that is fiction, uh, readers and writers, most of it is about serious noticing that you, the details of your childhood, you're talking so much about childhood, the texture, the pungent details that come back to you from your childhood. And uh, 
uh, writers are also, what is important in literature is aesthetic noticing. You notice the textures of the world around you, color, shape, taste, touch. And finally, he, uh, he has a phrase. Uh, he says you also have to uh, look at metaphysical. I mean, he says the metaphysical aspects of your life. Uh, you evoke details or you paint pictures of life so that people can reflect more about the structure of their own experiences. And you look at what it is to be human, what your life is composed of. Yeah. Now I find also Shoykut's new work, I mean, it's very sensorial, you know, in a certain sense. So uh, this is so detailed and this is, so, I mean, they're both very beautiful works. And then these are the very striking points that spoke to me as a reader of the two works. So could you also uh, sure. speak about the your relationship with the product, protagonist yeah. and also the sensorial aspect? Yeah, yeah, I mean also the gender. I think, uh, you know, I, this novel, writing of this novel surprised me a little bit because um, all novels surprise you as you write them, is that generally women play a very key role in my fiction. But here I had written a novel which was very male. Uh, th there are women, uh, are kind of shadowy presences. They are there and they are kind of outside. And yet, uh, a friend of mine, a uh, publisher of a uh, house with a radical feminist list, told me something very interesting that stayed with me, that it's a very male world, but not a masculine world. And that really got me thinking. And then I realized it's, it's male, but because the desires are not kind of moving in the direction they should be moving, it doesn't feel very masculine. And I think that kind of describes gender in a kind of proper way and I think in many ways this is an exploration of the masculine and I think obviously sensory is very uh, like for instance what is the masculinity of a monk what is that someone who has shaved his head but who there's a monk here who's young uh, he's very charismatic he plays cricket with the boys you know and the protagonist watches his arms and legs and I'm like I want to be like that I really want to be and he he, he gets all sweaty and he really plays. And it's kind of this gray zone between wanting to become that person and almost desiring that person. So, um, talk of a Freudian slip, you know, <laughs> book slipped. So, <laughs> so, and this is, these are also, that's why I think the child's consciousness is so fascinating because they don't really know what they want. Do they, I mean, Often we all have role models. I think all of us here can remember a teacher or a mentor we really admired. And okay, when was that admiration a little like a crush, right? So did we want to become like that person or in some ways we wanted that person? Long before we knew what wanting a person means. I think for many of us, the first crushes are teachers. So I'm in really interested in you know, those kind of questions and how you know, um, they bloom into a kind of a relationship. And I think what is most fascinating for me is that how these monks who are celibate are actually almost enigmatically silent about the erotic undercurrent they know very well are flowing through the ashram. They don't, because in some ways, you know, the question that I think the novel ends with is that the what holds the brotherhood together? Is there something more than the sort of vows they take? Is there something more? But it's, there's a silence there. So, yeah. Great. Um, so, actually, these classics that we've been talking about, these buildings, romance, they've been, you know, they've stayed with people for such a long time. People keep revisiting them and exploring their earlier lives. Their, I mean, their younger lives and then their older lives. Imagine how many times we've read great expectations or whatever, you know, you keep revisiting these works. And, um, you know, while writing, while writing, I have, I mean, I transpose into my characters, especially this is the, and there's a self exploratory process as I'm working on it. So what is your relationship with your writing on your characters as you work on it? Yeah. What is your relationship with your writers? Uh, with, um, See, uh, what I want, what I hope to do, I mean, writing, yeah, uh, what I hope to do is, uh, you know, uh, maybe create characters and situations with, uh, with which or with whom the reader can engage, you know. Uh, 
uh, not just someone whom the reader finds interesting, but uh, absorbed and engaged enough to follow my characters on their journey. I think that, that is something, and to engage with them and to, uh, in a way, write back, uh, feel deeply enough and question those things and, and get into some kind of self-reflective mode, you know. Uh, maybe try and understand the world a little better uh, in, uh, through my characters. Uh, I also want to give the reader something uh, which, which they would like, uh, which uh, would entertain them. You know, entertain not in the sense of the writer who is, what do you say, balancing a, a weightless ball at the end of her nose and the reader is just waiting to see how long it stays up and whether it falls. Uh, that is not the kind of relationship I'd like to establish, or that is not what uh, I would like to create with, through my characters. You know, I want to toss the ball back to the reader and have a game. And the reader has to strengthen your writing, you know, engage with it and give it strength and build the whole story. It, unless it means something and the reader comes back saying, yes, this means something to him. Aha, that was an aha moment. Uh, that is what I'd like to convey through my writing and through my uh, characters. Yeah, great. Yeah, Shoika? Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, the question I get uh, most often after the publication of this book is um, if I identify as gay. And it so happened that this book came out when um, Article 377, that section was abolished. And I f my first response is, because I this is my first book which has a queer romance at the heart. I'm not identified with having written about this before, or I haven't, you know, I'm not known for queer activism, obviously. Um, and my first response is, um, does it really matter? And I think I, was, I sp um, yeah. spoke um, at the Rainbow Lit Literature Festival last um, year in Delhi, uh, which was the first queer literature festival, and I think the title of a panel was very appropriate, who gets to tell a story, an artist or a queer artist? And um, I think the... You know, the question is, how does one identify oneself? How does one claim oneself? Because one never exhausts one's identity. Even if you say, I'm queer, or I'm straight, or I'm bicurious, or I'm bisexual, there's always something about your identity and your desires that gets left out, that you cannot describe yourself. I mean, this is a political thing. Obviously, we are living in this moment of intense political activism where the right to define ourselves. I mean, it's not just about desire. I mean, do I identify as white or black? Do I identify as Dalit or upper caste? You know, we, we recently, um, I was thinking of Yashika, that book is coming out as Dalit, like coming out as black or white, one can also come out. So we put the burden on the speaker that I am this. And honestly, you know, what is the space where we can claim more agency than desire? You know, if we, desi we, if, we if we identify ourselves by what we desire, then we should be able to tell what we desire, right? But I, th I find that that's wrong. You can't. You cannot tell what you desire. Even if you want to say this is what you desire, there are always desires outside that name that you cannot name. And this failing, this failing I find beautiful because a writer is in love with failures. This is where I guess a writer is slightly at odds with the activist because I think the activist, it's very important that they identify that who we are. And while we obviously, you know, when we're writing a nonfiction article or an op-ed, we are very firm. When you're creating a work of art, it's the failure of identity that is actually very tantalizing, very, 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 very moving. I mean, when you're writing about, I mean, whether you know, these are desires you felt as an adolescent, whether these, there are desires which haunts you when you don't quite know, when you least expect, you don't know. But these are desires which certainly come alive while you're writing. And I think, you know, this whole question of whether, you know, one can write as, you know, we all contain othernesses. We all identify ourselves as something, but that self always has an otherness. Like Michel Foucault put it beautifully. See, reason is reason because of madness. Reason can only be reason because it can point to madness and say that I am not that. In a way, reason needs madness 
to support. So in the same way, I think the other is always within us. And it's the moment of the other coming alive and kind of holding you by the scruff of your neck and suddenly becoming the self. That's where my relationship with the protagonist was most truly alive and hair raisingly so. That's so well put. Look, and I can so identify with it because writing about trafficked women, I mean, I haven't been trafficked, but then you feel so one with it, one with the person, one with, you identify so much, you know, with the character. Actually, so uh, um, the, you know, uh, it's very strange that you should uh, talk about, you know, you brought this about people wanting to know uh, the question that you were asked. Uh, after I wrote the draft of my book and I came up with this title, Boys from Good Families, uh, there are some similar questions that ran through my mind because boys, it is such a shifting identity. Are you going to uh, identify boys as against girls, boys against, as against men? And uh, so given the fact that we can't really fix our identities, so that is also something that comes up in this book. Uh, boys from good families, that too, what do you mean by good? What are families? Are good families those that are well off, that, that you know, conform to tradition? And are good boys or boys from good families those who uh, obey this, those who conform? What happens once they the veer away from clear. it? The irony yes. is clear in the title. Yeah. Actually, um, you know, I'm reminded of, uh, I also thought of, you know, A.K. Ramanujan has this essay called, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? Uh, which is uh, much read. And he says that uh, when he thinks, when he was uh, looking at the, uh, the title of his essay, he was reminded of a theater uh, exercise where actors are asked to repeat a, a, a commonplace line with emphasis on different words. So is there an Indian way of thinking? 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 Can Indians think at all? So uh, I thought of, uh, I thought the title of my book, it, uh, it had resonances with that. Boys from good families, boys from good families. So it, it sets up, as you said, your work surprises you, you know, you, and that I think is a quality of uh, writers maybe enjoying themselves that they haven't, exhausted all the possibilities of their work. Even their titles can uh, make them think and can uh, surprise them and give them some amount of joy, pleasure. Yes. Lovely. Uh, so before we open the house to questions, we'll just hear two small excerpts from Usha's and Shaikat's work. Could you read a bit for us, please? passage. Uh, my protagonist has just noticed the girl in the outhouse and I think it's his, his first crush, so to say. He was surprised that she accepted to come at all. He was sure only when he saw her across the street from the temple, although it took him a few seconds to recognize her. She was dressed not in her usual long skirt and man's bush shirt, but a half sari, a long pleated skirt in a black and white print with a white gauzy veil or davani drawn across her chest like the pallu of a sari, her feet shod in slippers, her hair sleek and shiny with oil. They cycled through Cabin Park where the gulmohars were a blaze of red and emerged opposite the st stadium. There it was, a white building, chamfered between two roads, set back in a garden, a ramp leading up to it. There were several tables in the large high-ceilinged hall covered in white tablecloths, each bearing a vase with a single red rose. They sat by the window with a view of the garden and the island where the roads met. The waiter in white uniform who had addressed him as sir brought them the menu, opened it and placed it in front of her. She closed it immediately and handed it back to him with the scrupulousness of a person returning property that was not hers. What will you have? He could not say her name. Sweet Kara coffee. I will have whatever you decide, she said. Sweet salt and spice, the flavors of a balanced palate 
and the pleasantly bitter slough of coffee to wash it down. I have been wanting to come to this hotel since I saw a film with the same name, he told her. The film about, is about a girl with a cat. At the end of the film, she decides to leave town, but the cat runs away, so she stays back to look for it. Does the girl find the cat, she asked. Yes, she does, and the man who is in love with her. That's only right, she said, looking at him with her steady eyes. A cat needs to be taken care of. It is a helpless thing, a mute animal, a mook prani, she called it. The phrase could well embrace a cat and a man in love. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks. So full of irony in phrase. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shaka? Yeah. So I'll also read a, a very brief passage. Since I've spoken a lot about the ashram atmosphere and the closed romantic um, uh, idyllic space, I'll read a, a little couple of paragraphs from a very different space, the kind of gritty road space where this boy finds himself. And he has this a gift, he's a very good debater, he speaks very well. And uh, his gift gets abused by political parties who kind of use him as a kind of child prodigy to speak at political gatherings. So it's taken from one of those situations. A few weeks later, the beast was born. Justice for sex workers, said one orange banner. The color same as the, that announcing local volleyball tournaments. The National Sex Workers Union said the cool white banner pinned across the wall behind the raised platform. That made no sense, Yogi told himself. Yogi is the protagonist's nickname. What was national, the union or the sex workers? And what was national about prostitutes and pimps from the sleepy houses across the railway station getting their anger knotted together? People. Sometimes he didn't really understand them. There was, magic, there was music and songs and poems. Paul Robeson and all that. The gambit was opened by a fattish, weird-haired woman in jeans and khadi kurta. She was studying for a doctorate in London and was a professional hellraiser for the cause of prostitutes. It was a cause, she told the crowd, that had a life of its own in many corners of the world where hookers worked with licenses just like doctors and chartered accountants. She spoke in a sing-song and from time to time looked like she needed a chalk and a blackboard. But the pale banner of the National Sex Workers Union was all she had behind her. They were not just some pillows, she said, men clamped their legs around to masturbate and could throw away when soiled. Her nice analysis of masturbation, repeated a few times, thickened the knot of people before the stage and sent strong murmurs through them. These were she sang human beings, women just like those who helped them at banks and stores, who cooked their meals and washed their dishes, agile women who cleaned their pipes to flush out the needs that might have turned them into rapists and murderers. By drawing out the violence, taking it on themselves, the women were like sharp, skilled snake charmers, helped them stand up for their rights. She flung a khadi-wrapped woman r r arm in the air and a fist rolled into a ball. Oh, and pillows did not spread diseases. Human beings did. Without a sane system and a sprinkling of peace, they would all be wiped off by AIDS. Shooting little arrows of terror into every man's loins, she stepped down. Lovely. I know the language is, um, can be offensive, but I was trying to capture a person's sensibility and the way they thought about it. And I think adolescent languages, consciousness is very very disturbing sometimes, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. But such are the words that live on. And with that, uh, should you have any questions? Yes. Uh, to you, Mr. So, Majinda. Uh, so any time it has happened with you that uh, you are creating a pr protagonist, so it has overcome your subconscious, unconscious, or superconscious mind, and uh, you don't have any free will. Means like it, uh, protagonist has free will, and whatever it, uh, it is saying, it character. So uh, you are following. Yeah. Like uh, while you are sleeping, walking, means whatever. Means you don't have any um, uh, control over your intellects. It is just so. I just want to know about that yeah. protagonist. Yeah. I think you've spoken like a true writer. I think that's what, I think that's the best thing. And this is where failure is so important because I feel like 
you know, when you create a character, of course, for me, I need a seed of reality to create a character, and then I can make it a forest, but I need that seed from reality. But once you create a character, I feel it's working the most when I'm failing, when it's out of my control, when it has become an animal I cannot control. I want to put them on page and make them say something, but they say something else entirely. So this losing of control is where, I mean, this is where I guess writing is a very kind of wild business where they just slip out and become something else. And, you know, I mean, uh, that's why writing is unique, is where kind of losing control over your work is actually the mark of your success. That when you feel the thing is going out of control, you know it's working. Because it's exact, it has become a human thing, it's become a living being. So definitely, I, I do believe that, you know, I, I like that. I like, I want to, I wait for my novel to get to the point where I start failing. Because I know that's when I don't have to do the work. The novel will now take its own life. <coughs> Can you uh, mention the name of protagonist? Which novel? Uh, I, I mean, all, all my novels. Like in this novel, the protagonist is called Anirvan. He's nicknamed uh, Yogi by his friends because he can meditate like a yogi and he wants to become a monk. Uh, in my second novel, The Firebird, he's called Ori, you know, which is actually the Sanskrit meaning of the word is enemy. And he acts like an enemy to his mother because he, in the end, is, you know, his mother's death, he has a strange hand to play. So, I mean, all my novels, I feel when I wrote, um, there's a kind of a force, you know, that uh, overcomes me. And that, that, that loss is the moment of sort of revelation. Thank you, thank you. And I think that's true of all writers. You know, Usha, do you experience that as well? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. in the sense, when you are, uh, um, to the extent that when you are writing something or maybe creating a character, so to say, they are with you all the time. And once you begin with that seed of reality, you never know where it's going to go. Uh, you want to keep them in control. Uh, in, it's quite interesting, you mentioned uh, Lolita and Nabokov. Uh, and Nabokov was asked, what about your characters? Do they run away with you? He says, no, they are galley slaves. I control them completely. But then that's, it's, 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 it's a remarkable feat. He was probably being ironical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, possibly, but you know, he's managed to create uh, the kind of characters and he has them in control, but it's, right. it's not always possible. They run your mind over and they occupy uh, all, even when you're doing something else, you're thinking about them. And, uh, and then you have to just go with the flow. You have to see how it works out. In fact, it's a journey. It's a journey of such an explorative journey that you don't know. It's, it's a unique path you yeah. uh, traverse. And it's a beautiful journey when you start down to and do a it. And a terrifying one. Terrifying. Not just beautiful, yeah. but terrifying too. Yeah, I have a question to Mr. Shoikar. Uh, do you have any plan to uh, publish your book in Bengali? It's actually um, being translated Currently, um, uh, Arunavu Sinha, the translator, is actually translating. And it's very interesting you mentioned that because he calls it, um, we've been talking, it's not a translating, it's almost restoring. Because in many ways it is, <laughs> you know, there's a Bengali milieu. And when it, it's coming alive in Bengali, it's, it's very interesting. In, it almost like seems original. So there's that, that very interesting. But at the same time, I'm like the certain things like violent language, which I think we can hide behind curse words in English and kind of pretend a space. But when, when you know, he's shown me some of the chapters to me, and in Bengali, those curse words sound terrifying. Plus, I think there are a lot of allusions which will hit very close to home for people in Bengal. So I'm kind of curious and also maybe a little worried <laughs> to see what that life will be in Bengali. So, uh, when we can expect it will be available for the us? I, mm, he's done a few chapters. It's you know he has a lot of projects. So whenever it's ready, maybe hopefully by the end of this year, the book will be at least in production. But then we'll see. When Thank you. There's Actually, this popular that's interesting question. because uh, again, you know, putting back into the language the ethos from which it came, a girl and a river is also being translated from English into Kannada. I, I mean, it's going to take time, and these are the concerns. How will it sound? You know, what is the language that they will put in where English can, you know, English can, is used, it ca you can get by with many things in English. 
but how are they going to, how is it going to sound when it goes into the language of the original where you know the language that would have been spoken by your protagonists it goes back into that uh, exactly. community and into that background that ambiance exactly. because english becomes a kind of a say we talked about earlier how it's alien and that alienness becomes a kind of a shelter we hide behind it i mean even you know i'm just saying even the word fuck it's just easier to say it in English yes. than in a lot of vernacular languages because we just feel like we wince when we hear and you know there's a part where they're saying oh oh their dicks are chopped off chopped off or things like that and when I read that in Eng in Bangla I'm like oh my god that sounds so yeah so it's it's like we've been hiding behind this whole bourgeois sort of English sensibility and be saying a lot of things but I think when it goes back to its original language it has a kind of savage brutality which i think is more powerful but one needs a tough stomach for that yeah. yeah actually works need to be transliterated and and then they kind of work you know better yeah quite <coughs> so I could, when i was entering the hall i had a very important word from you rebel after that you spoke of mulka janand untouchable the two leaves and the butt, etc., 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 which inspires me to talk to you someday. Can you write a new national anthem for India's future? National anthem? Yeah. Why I am asking you, you be confused. When I went to Santhidikata to research on the national anthem, Jana Gadamana, I spent one week in Santhidikata because so many uh, stories I heard. At that time, there were a group of young people in that area uh, near Shanti Nikhetan. They attacked Shanti Nikhetan. Their argument was Tagore was a bourgeois agent, etc., etc. It was going on. So, I studied many things. There was another e e e poem written by Tagore. Why India did not accept that? This is my question. Therefore, I want you to write a new anthem. The second story was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you you I know the poem. <laughs> the, Tagore says, <laughs> Leave this chanting and telling of beads. Whom does the worship in the dark corner of a temple with doors all shut? He is there where the tiller is tilling the soil. He is there where the path maker is breaking stones. Go and worship. That poem should have been much better for India. If we accepted it today, we would have been a different country. Today we are still from Europe and America. We need to rebel this country. <laughs> How do you think? <laughs> I think Rabindranath's legacy is a bit too much to wear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wouldn't want to <laughs> wish that upon myself, just being a Bengali. But I, I just one small answer to that question is: I, as a writer, I am much more interested in how the political comes into our personal lives. So I'm interested in politics as it enters our kitchens and our bedrooms. You know, I am much more interested in the stories of the quotidian, which is why I'm such a great admirer of Shashi Deshpande. I mean, I'd much rather yes. read a poem about two old women gossiping in a kitchen than a, a big novel about national ambition. So I, 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 I think my novels have been described as very political, but they're political in a very personal way. How they enter, not how they operate in the parliament, but how they operate in the kitchen. But I think, Usha, you've written you know, very well about anti-colonial politics in, in your novel. So maybe you can uh, respond to that question too. That, uh, oh, quite right. I mean, you spoke about the other poem. Uh, I, we can have, that can be celebrated through, it is through literature. I think our literatures do celebrate it. You have books in various languages which are talking about anti-colonial experiences yeah. or how people came to recognize their position, you know. Uh, you, you, you had a hunky-dory position under the British uh, in my novel. Uh, this girl's father is a lawyer and he straddles both worlds, that of the Maharaja and of the British very comfortably. But there comes a time when you have to question your loyalties, you have to, you have to kind of make sense of your existence. What kind of life have I been living? And instead of, say, taking one, a national anthem, which is a symbol, so to say. Uh, the reason we have literature, the reason we have fiction is we can celebrate and we can, um, you know, propose uh, contrary narratives or contrary anthems which people can read. 
And the uh, very thought of national anthem say. makes us think of standing up, and I think writers don't like standing up. <laughs> 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 so we don't we are so comfortable. Even when you're watching movies to stand up, so that's not. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thanks much for being here with us this evening. Please do pick up their books. Please show your books. Please show your works. Please do pick up these books <laughs> and uh, give us your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, much very much for, for being, being here, here on a Sunday evening. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, dignitaries on the stage. Uh, the audience, I request you to. Um, so there's a uh, Varun Grover happening at. It's happening at the SPI Hangar. Right?